Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. In part one of our Old Powers Are Waking series, we introduced the idea that the magic in the world of ice and fire is associated with the various gods we know of throughout the world, and how making this link is crucial to understanding what will transpire in the wars to come. We also read parts of A Game of Thrones, Bran Three, when Bran has a dream where he finds himself rapidly falling through outer space and is first introduced to the Three-Eyed Crow. Appearing from the Grey Mist, the Crow tells Bran that he will die when he hits the ground, and that he must choose, fly or die. Bran flies, and according to Jojen, is given his third eye by the Crow. We also pointed out how Bran, being an untrained warg and skin changer, has committed two of three abominations by taking Hodor and eating human meat as his wolf. Coming up, we will be discussing more of Bran's storyline, the ways of the warg, the life of a skin changer, the powers of a green seer, Jojen's dream about a winged wolf, and lastly, how this relates to Korn's statement that the old powers are waking. So, let's do this. Warg is the Norse word for wolf, and is employed by Martin in what is a doubtless borrowing from J.R.R. Tolkien. In Westeros, the term is used specifically for those who slip into wolves while dreaming. This ability is most prominently used in the story by the Stark children, who all have wolf dreams, with the exception of Sansa, whose wolf died. And in these wolf dreams, they are able to see what is happening in real time for their wolves. According to Hagen, who was Varamir's teacher until he killed him, there is a very special bond between a warg and his or her wolf. He repeatedly told Varamir that wolves and women wed for life. Take one. That's a marriage. The wolf is part of you from that day on, and you're part of him. Both of you will change. There's also... An author's annotation in Clash of Kings, John 7, that states that all wargs are skin changers, but not all skin changers are wargs, which seems to indicate that there is something special about being a warg. In fact, we know that there is an actual difference between the two, besides the obvious fact that a warg is a term specific to those bonded to a wolf, because Hagen instructed Vermeer on, quote, the ways of the warg, and the secrets of the skin changer. From that, it is clear that Vermeer thinks of the two as distinctly different things. When you combine both of those annotations and Vermeer's thoughts into one cohesive idea, it appears that the nature of the relationship between a warg and his wolf and dreams are two of the most distinct differences between skin changing and warging. To further illustrate this point, Vermeer's recollection of what Hagen taught him about the nature of other beasts and their relationship and or effect on their prospective skin changers provides us with our only insight as to what skin changing other animals does to the skin changer. Other beasts were best left alone, the hunter had declared. Cats were vain and cruel, always ready to turn on you. Elk and deer were prey, where their skins too long and even the bravest man became a coward. Bears, boars, badgers, weasels, Hagen did not hold with such. Some skins you never want to wear, boy. You won't like what you'd become. Birds were the worst to hear him tell it. Men were not meant to leave the earth. Spend too much time in the clouds, and you never want to come back down again. I know skin changers who've tried hawks, owls, ravens, 
Even in their own skins, they sit moony, staring up at the bloody blue. So, in looking at the relationship that develops between a warg and a wolf, and contrasting it to that of a skin changer and other animals, it appears that the warg relationship is unique in that the wolf and man become part of one another over time, and they are wed for life whereas the relationship between skin changers and their prospective animals seems to cause a far more one-sided change. The skin changer is changed by the animal, while the skin changer has little or no effect on that animal. This also seems to explain why the Stark children's direwolves so quickly became their protectors, which is best illustrated by Summer's rescue of Bran from the cat's paw. Wolves might be more loyal to their warg than other animals are to their skin changer, but they are also harder to control when the warg is inside them, as demonstrated by Jojen's constant reminders to Bran to remember who he is when he slips into Summer's skin, and Bran's constant bending to Summer's will when he does warg, as opposed to his complete dominance that he has over Hodor when he slips into his skin. As Hagen said, Although the bond can be strong, no man can ever truly tame a wolf, which creates something of a power struggle. So, wolves are loyal, but as evidence from Bran nearly losing himself in summer on more than one occasion, a warg enjoys less control of their wolf and runs the risk of being completely overtaken by their wolf if they stay in it too long. Warging with a dire wolf appears to have some element of destiny to it, just as John said to Ned when they found the dire wolf pups. The litter had the same number of wolves of the same gender as the Stark children, and the bond seemed to happen almost instantaneously. How else was John not only able to hear Ghost, which is odd because Ghost never makes a sound, but was also able to very quickly and easily find him even though he is pure white and hidden in the snow. How could this happen? Well, it seems that John must have been able to feel Ghost or hear him in his head, because no one else heard anything, and therefore he knew where to look. One mystery we can't seem to wrap our minds around is when the direwolves sleep. They travel with their warg by day and hunt every night, leaving no time to sleep. Magical beings from throughout the world, such as Melisandre and Mokoro, another red priest, don't need much sleep or food, leading us to believe the direwolves are creatures that are very closely tied to magic or are magical themselves, allowing them to seemingly go months without sleeping. So how does being a warg or a skin changer relate to being a green seer? Well, According to Bloodraven, one man in a thousand is born a skin changer, and only one skin changer in a thousand can be a green seer. So what does that tell us about green seeing and skin changing? They are the same thing. But it seems likely that you have to be a very powerful skin changer to be capable of slipping into a weirwood. This is backed up by the fact that it is said that the greatest amongst the green seers could wear the skin of any beast that walks, swims, or flies. Maester Lewin tells Bran that Greenseers were considered the wisest amongst the children of the forest, and were also the ones that carved the faces in the trees to keep watch over the woods, and they were also the ones responsible for working dark magic to bring forth the Hammer of the Waters, breaking the Arm of Dorne. So it would seem that by Maester Lewin's definition of Greenseeing, Individuals with green sight are called green seers. So keep that in mind because we're going to be coming back to that in a minute. During Bran's lessons in the cave, Bloodraven teaches Bran more about the children of the forest and their green seers. Those you call the children of the forest have eyes as golden as the sun. But once in a great while, one is born amongst them with eyes as red as blood, or green as the moss on a tree in the heart of the forest. By these signs do the gods mark those they have chosen to receive the gift. The chosen ones are not robust, 
and their quick years upon the earth are few, for every song must have its balance. But once inside the wood they linger long indeed. A thousand eyes, a hundred skins, wisdom deep as the roots of ancient trees. Green Seers. Does that sound like any characters we know? That sounds exactly like Jojen. Jojen is small and sickly. He has moss green eyes. He has green dreams. And according to Mira, he has green sight. So let's return to Bran's conversation with Lewin. That conversation started with Bran telling Lewin that Mira said that her brother had green sight, which by Lewin's definition makes Jojen a green seer. He can also sense skin changers and wargs, which according to Vermeer and an annotation is a hallmark characteristic of skin changers. So why, when Jojen appears to possess every single identifiable characteristic of a green seer, does he insist that he is not one? Well, to answer that question, we're going to have to start from Jojen's very first appearance and work our way up to the present to try to figure out why he truly believes that he is not a green seer when it appears to be abundantly clear that he is. As mentioned earlier, Jojen has green dreams. In one such dream, Jojen saw a winged wolf bound to the earth by a massive stone chain and a three-eyed crow fruitlessly pecking at it, trying to set it free. Jojen told his father what he saw, and Howland determined it was Bran, and sent Jojen and Mira to Winterfell. When they arrived, they pledged an ancient oath to the Starks, the very same oath that the Reeds had pledged to the original King of Winter. Later that night, Bran has a wolf dream where he sees Mira and Jojen. The rattle of iron made his ears prick up. His brother heard it too. They raced through the undergrowth towards the sound. Bounding across the still water at the foot of the old white one, he caught the scent of a stranger, the man smell well mixed with leather and earth and iron. The intruders had pushed a few yards into the wood when he came upon them, a female and a young male, with no taint of fear to them even when he showed them the white of his teeth. His brother growled low in his throat, yet still they did not run. Here they come, the female said. Mira, some part of him whispered, some wisp of the sleeping boy lost in the wolf dream. Did you know they would be so big? They will be bigger still before they are grown the young male said, watching them with eyes large, green, and unafraid. The black one is full of fear and rage, but the gray is strong, stronger than he knows. Can you feel him, sister? No, she said, moving a hand to the hilt of the long brown knife she wore. Go careful, Jojen. He won't hurt me. This is not the day I die. The male walked toward them, unafraid, and reached out for his muzzle, a touch as light as a summer breeze. Yet at the brush of those fingers, the wood dissolved, and the very ground turned to smoke beneath his feet and swirled away laughing. And then he was spinning and falling, falling, falling. This wolf dream begins with Bran slash Summer hearing the rattle of iron as Mira and Jojen open the gate to enter the godswood, where both Summer and Shaggy Dog are being kept. Since, as Rickon so eloquently stated, Shaggy was bad. What's interesting to note is that Jojen said he could sense Bran's power within Summer and Rickon's anger and fear within Shaggy, yet Mira feels nothing. This goes back to what we were talking about earlier when we said that Jojen can sense skin changers within their animals, which is something that is said only skin changers can do. The most important part here is what happened at the end. The instant Jojen touched Summer, the ground turned to smoke and swirled away, laughing. So why did that happen? 
And more importantly, why was the smoke laughing at Bran when he fell? Well, bear with us, because we are about to tell you why we think that the crow not only tricked Bran, but Jojen as well. When Bran wakes from his falling dream, his forehead is burning where the crow had pecked him, which according to Jojen was because the crow gave Bran a third eye. Bran later thinks about how the crow tricked him into flying, which seems to mean that Bran was deceived into taking and briefly opening his third eye. So, if the very first thing that the crow did was trick Bran, it doesn't seem far-fetched to believe that the crow did the same thing to Jojen. After all, the crow is a tricksy bird. So the crow first appeared to Jojen when he was on the verge of dying of grey water fever when he was young, and has been visiting Jojen periodically ever since. On the crow's last visit prior to Jojen and Mira coming to Winterfell, Jojen dreamed, for all intents and purposes, that the crow needed his help to free the winged wolf from its chains that bound it to the earth. Howland Reed determined that the winged wolf was Bran, and sent Jojen and Mira to help him. Since all crows are liars, it seems entirely possible that the crow misled Jojen in his dream, giving him the impression that it needed its help to free who Howland Reed believed was Bran. But is Bran the winged wolf from Jojen's green dream? What if the winged wolf is something else? Something that has been trapped beneath Winterfell for thousands of years? Well, as far as we can tell, the only thing that was set free during Jojen's time at Winterfell was not a wolf, but it did have wings. After opening his third eye, while he, Rickon, Hodor, Osha, Jojen, and Mira are hiding in the crypts, Bran sees something through Summer's eyes that we believe is what the crow really wanted freed. Summer and Shaggy Dog were wandering through a curiously well-burned Winterfell when Summer looked up and saw something shocking. He saw a, quote, winged snake whose roar was a river of flame, which of course everyone assumes is either a yet-to-be-identified dragon or maybe even Drogon, but what is most interesting about it is that its roar was a river of flame. That seems to indicate that this winged snake was scorching Winterfell into a state of borderline ruin. It always seemed odd to us that the Boltons would get so out of hand in destroying Winterfell, when their ultimate goal was to make it their seat. Lighting a few fires to make it seem like the Ironborn tried to burn it before surrendering, would help sell their lie to the north, but destroying the castle seems a bit much. I mean, they allegedly burned all the horses and livestock, which really makes no sense because they're useful. Why wouldn't they just take the horses and livestock with the women and children that they took back to the Dreadfort? Heck, they could have used them to help transport people such as Old Nan, who isn't exactly mobile these days. Also, Winterfell is made almost entirely of stone, and fire doesn't do much, if anything, to stone. Yet according to just about everyone who says something about it, Winterfell was destroyed by fire. That seems to indicate that it wasn't a normal fire that did all this damage, but it was the winged snake. So, what was that huge winged snake? And why did it attack Winterfell? Well, the number of possible answers to those questions is limited only by the scope of George R. R. Martin's imagination. But we do have a theory. As we have mentioned in a few of our previous videos, we believe Winterfell is called Winterfell because it was built where mankind fought and won the original Battle for the Dawn. In other words, it was built at a location where winter, quite literally, fell. According to Melisandre, the Lord of Light has been at war with the Great Other since the time of creation. What is interesting about that is George R. R. Martin modeled the Lord of Light off of the Egyptian sun god Ra, who was in an internal war with his enemy, Apep, 
who just so happens to have been represented as a massive snake that many myths claimed was defeated and imprisoned in the underworld. The Roman version of Apep was a snake so large he attempted to swallow the sun every day, trying to force the world into a state of never-ending darkness. So, Apep and his Roman counterpart appear to be the inspiration for the Great Other. And based on the fact that Apep was at war with the sun god Ra, it would have to have been a flying snake. And given the fact that it tried to swallow the sun every day, it seems possible that it might have swallowed a little of the sun's fire, similar to the dragon creation legend coming from the Far East in our story, where the first dragons drank the sun's fire. This also lines up with the northern legend that there is a fire-breathing beast under Winterfell whose fire heats their hot pools. We believe that following his defeat in the first battle for the dawn, the Great Other was imprisoned underground, and to ensure that he never escaped, Bran the Builder built Winterfell right on top of him. This also lines up with Corn Halfhand's statement that the old powers are waking because this event at Winterfell just so happened to have occurred just prior to him saying that. So, like Jojen always says, green dreams don't lie, but they are often cryptic and the seer can err in their interpretation. He did go to Winterfell to help the crow free the winged wolf, only it wasn't Bran that he freed. So, stay tuned, like, and subscribe for more clarity on A Song of Ice and Fire, brought to you by the Order of the Green Hand.